A bloody book's face. Olympic Hotel, Birmingham, Deborah speaking. No, oh, just listen to that racket. What prop put Bugs face on? <laughs> We're talking about the Sprog. You got any ice, Gaffer? Ice? <laughs> you want ice with your night nurse now, do you? <laughs> any preference? Broken? Crushed? Cubed? Perhaps I can rustle up a selection of Phileas Fogs on an artichoke dip? Oi! I'm Mr. Springer, the owner. I'm not the gaffer. Same thing, isn't it? Well, it may be the same thing in the Latin quarter of Abergavenny. But this is Smedic village, mate. He would do things with a bit more bloody panache. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cheer up, you miserable sword. It's happy hour. Yes, I'll tell him. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> it's a game, man. It's a game. I go away, I leave down your own for five minutes, I come back to a fire full of Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, man, bugger off. Will you practice in your rooms? I just phoned for you. A fella called Simon. Simon? Don't know any Simon? Simon Thorpe. Never heard of him. He's your sister's son. Oh, oh, oh not that muffin. What's wrong with him, then? He's a depressing git. <laughs> And he's related to you. <laughs> anyway, he's popping round. He wants to speak to you. What do you think your bloody answer phone's for? Here, nip down to odd bins and get us a bag of ice. Oh, you've got some chance. It's 7.15. I'm supposed to finish at 6. Deborah, Deborah, if all you wanted in life was to get home in time for top of the poxy pops, why, oh, why did you join the heady, high-powered world of... Uh, hoteling? I didn't. I came here on a YTS scheme. Yes. But why, out of the millions of unemployed, did I choose you? Because Filipinos are too pricey for you. <laughs> Deborah, Deborah, I saw something in you. You have a unique quality, which, with the right guidance, could send you to the very heights of this profession. Now, then, you nipped down the off license. I'm you know? going home. Oh, well, book it off, and there's plenty more where you came from. <laughs> I'm at staff motivation conference, eh, Harry? Good evening, Mr. Strachan. Come on, Davy. It's no Mr. Strachan now. The name's Dougie. I'm not your teacher anymore. No, she's actually learning something. I'm a tutor now. Future lies before her like a jewel. Oh, I see. So the ritual cremation of an unsuspecting English breakfast is an educational priority now, is it? <laughs> education? What education did you give her? Look at the poor bench. She's ended up a skivvy. Oh, <laughs> yes, go on, you get off home to Chumba Wumba. <laughs> I'm just a man keeping you off the door, Q. Don't ever lose your sense of humour, Harry. <laughs> so, how was your day at school? Depressing. The police raided us. They found a bag of crack in a desk. She was a bloody good history teacher as well. <laughs> so I've told you, I've told you before, man, you want to get out of that cool that's comprehensive and into a bit of private teaching. Earn some decent money. Man of your ability, you could go right to the top. What do you want, Harry? Note. Can I not give an old pal a compliment? Mind you, uh, <clears throat> before you get settled, nip down the off you and get us some ice, will you? You what? We may be old friends, but I'm a paying guest here. Go yourself, you lazy, bold sod. <laughs> Do you know what they're putting them things? I don't want to know. The parts James Herriot couldn't reach. <laughs> Tell you what, you nip down the off and I'll do you one of my fry-ups. I'm not that depressed. What? <laughs> you turned down one of my fry-ups for that bull scrotum and a bap. Harry, I'd rather eat the animal's full wedding tackle. <laughs> Suit yourself. Just look at this place, man. You know why I bought this place? I vaguely remember you mentioning it a few thousand times. Mm. Those newspapers all said that Birmingham was going to be the venue for the 1992 Olympic Games. But did Birmingham get the Olympics? If it did, it kept bloody quiet about it. <laughs> exactly. Barca, Pig and Lona got the Olympics. Birmingham got the milk race. <laughs> Just got me army, pay out money and all after the Falklands and all that. This place just seemed ideal. Apart from his sister living up the road with a wimpy, brummy husband, See, that's why I've named all the rooms after Olympic heroes. I know, that's why for the last five years I've been living in the Jeff Cape suite. <laughs> I was going to create Birmingham's premier hotel. 
I envisage the beautiful people of the sports and the pop world just wafting through me for you on the way to me subterranean swimming pool and solarium complex. Linford Christie, Bon Jovi. <laughs> Harry, can I ask you a question? What colours the sky on your planet? <laughs> I thought that might be a bit confusing for a jock. <laughs> I've worked my fingers to the bone on this place. Look at that man, stumps. <laughs> you know what this place looked like when I bought it? Aye, like this. Exactly. <laughs> Council wouldn't give me a grant, would they? Oh, no, 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 no. But if I was setting up a mosque or a lesbians against everything club, they'd be tripping over their desert boots to give us the dosh. <laughs> Makes you sick, man, doesn't it? It never fails, pal. Harry, is there, a, is there a serious point to this story? All I'm seeing is, Douglas, I had a dream. Who said that? <laughs> Martin Luther King. No, 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 no. It was Abba! I have a dream! <laughs> Echo 7 to base, POB. Going to the Olympic Hotel. Roger 7. You from the emergency exit section, are you? No, I'm nothing to do with the council. I'm a civil servant. I'm staying at the Olympic. What, voluntary? <laughs> yes. Do you know it well, then? Well, I know the owner, Harry Springer. He's a ripe. He's my uncle. <laughs> oh. Salt of the earth, old Harry. He mustn't have Dougie then. Scotty's chap, the teacher. He lives at the hotel with Harry. Oh, yeah, I know old Dougie. Great gambling man. Had his ass repossessed. That's why he's stuck staying at the Olympic. <laughs> they were in the army together. Served in the Falklands. Uncle Harry saved Dougie's life, you know. Uh, yeah, he has mentioned it a few times. So what are you doing there? I've had a bit of domestic strife with the wife, as it were. I suppose you've all been through it? Not me, pal. I'm divorced. I have a dream, a song to sing. I believe in angels. Oh, they're lovely, lovely. I bet you have a lark with them, don't you, eh? <laughs> Good boys. Oh, yeah, it's twins, actually, Mr. Springer. Lovely, lovely. <laughs> Just look at that nutter, Baker. What sort of existence has he got, eh? Just mooches around here all day morning. Wouldn't it do for you, would it, Harry? No, it wouldn't. I keep telling the man, get a life. Get a life? The man's got too many lives. He's schizophrenic. <laughs> Suspected schizophrenic, that's all. When the care workers first brought him here, he thought he was Saddam Hussein. Oh, no, remember, I don't know, I kept my hands off him. Who was he thinking yesterday? Some musician? No, Ringo Starr. <laughs> oh, my idea, you know. I said to John and Paul, why don't we do an album called Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band before we get on to my submarine idea? Shut up. They got all the credit. I got a voiceover on Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> a famous songwriter, you know. Did you ever hear Back Off Boogaloo? <laughs> How's a man get into a state like that, eh? That's what years of drug abuse does for you. What's your excuse? <laughs> hey, I'm trying to be serious here. I'm a Falklands veteran. I'm proud of it. Sometimes I look round this place, I just wonder what it was all for. Aye, I agree. Thatcher and our cronies deserted those most in need. You're right, I deserve better. I'm not talking about you, you mercenary punts. I'm talking about those poor sods. Poor sods? Where were they when the orgies were on the warpath, eh? We fought for our country. 21 years you and me served together in the army. Harry, you didn't fight for your country. I fought for my country. You cooked for your country. <laughs> didn't fight. Hey, you don't get the best part of a 20-pound water floating around your guts from an exploding bread pudding, you know. <laughs> I was a frontline combat cook. <laughs> Just as well I was as well, innit, eh? Still, I never saw myself as a hero. All I saw was a pal in danger. I thought to hell with that main feeling. Oh, danger. for the love of God. All right, you saved my life. I'm eternally indebted. Now, chase a bloody record. I never mentioned saving your life. All the nightmares I've suffered ever since. <laughs> Mind you, I suppose, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be here now, would you? I often think about that, Harry. Look, 
I'm as sensitive to human <laughs> suffering as the next man. But I didn't buy this place just to take in the council's down and outs and nutters. I wouldn't care if they sent me a decent class of loser. Harry, you great English plank, has it not got through to you? People don't choose to live in a dump like this. You've got families here who thought they owned their own homes only to have them stolen by the banks and building societies. Folks who thought they had a future till your Tory government organised the biggest closing down sale of the century. Folks who've been starved out their own countries. Starved? <laughs> hey, you don't get bristles like this from a Red Cross parcel, you know. <laughs> they are political refugees. Listen to me. I care about this homeless the same as most people in this country. That's what worries me. <laughs> I don't see these people here as the dregs of society that they are. They are my hotel guests, and I treat them as such. <laughs> my family has been the vanguard of public service for generations. Public service? Your grandfather was a hangman. Well, only when they were busy. <laughs> and I tell you what, he did more than all the Lord Longfords and the probation officers put together. There was nobody re-offended after my granddad had a chat with him. <laughs> there you go. Keep the change. Oh, cheers. Uh, have you stayed here before? No, first time. But Uncle Harry's told me all about it. I tell you, after the day I've had, I can't wait for a nice dip in his subterranean pool and half an hour in the salon. <laughs> See ya. See ya. Pool? I knew he had a damn problem. Good evening, Mrs. Musket. I'm not hungry, Mr. Springer. Please, uh, don't cook for me. No, no, the kitchen's closed tonight, but uh, I bet you'll do for one of my fry-ups first thing in the morning, eh? There you are, let me help you with that, darling. No, in you go. Mr. Springer, I've just That's come it. down. There you go, but pet. I'm Off you go for your beauty stick. Just press the button and up you go. No. That's it. I no, up, oh, no, up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, no. Oh, no, oh, don't worry, pet. There's only two directions you can't get lost. <laughs> Simon's arrived. He wants to stay over. He's had a wee tiff with Sandra. I'm a bit worried about him. I showed him up to his room and ten minutes later he comes down in his swimming trunks and takes the lift to the cellar. Oh, Marvellous, isn't it, eh? Why does he have to come round here to crack up? When I've got me full quarter of headbangers already. Come on, man, he's family. Only on my sister's side. <laughs> you see, he's never been masculine like me, you know. Nor my sister come to that like. No, oh, he's more like me brother-in-law, you know, all uh, quilted uh, car coats and small advocates. I think we all know what uh, Simon's problem is. Oh, no, no, that old chestnut again. Simon is a married man. So is Rock Hudson. <laughs> Hello, this is the 20th century Colin Harry. Listen, you biff, he was acting irrationally. Yeah, and I saw him in a film once with Doris Day pissed before he was. I'm talking about Simon. All right, all right, I'll have a word with him. I haven't got enough on me plate, have I? <laughs> See what I mean? Just leave this to me. Simon! Oh, Uncle Larry. <laughs> Why are you dressed like that, man? You look a prize dick. <laughs> Couldn't find the pole. Just a smelly old cellar down there. Yes, I had it converted into a basement. <laughs> <laughs> now then, you come down and have a nice sit down and a chat with Dougie and I'll get you brandy. Relax, Simon. You're amongst friends here. Your uncle's here too. <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, not that I'm complaining. I just thought the hotel would be a bit more... Luxurious. Habitable. <laughs> Uncle Larry always said every room had toilet facilities. Well, there's a window. <laughs> there you go, Simon. You sign there, thank you. <laughs> Should he leave a tap? Don't be sarcastic with blood. Now then, you knock that back, get a good night's kip. Tomorrow's Saturday, I'll do your full English fry. Play off the boy. He needs cheering up. <laughs> you got any ice? Ice. 
You want ice as well, do you? Sorry to be a bother. No, 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 that's no bother, that's no bother. Where's my car keys? I'll only be an hour. <laughs> only been on the go since six o'clock the bloody small. Simon, <laughs> this row with Sandra, what's the problem? Ah, uh, it's the old, old story. Another man. And Sandra found out. <laughs> Dougie, I found out. She's got herself an 18-year-old, a bodybuilder. Looks like a young Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not looks that count, it's personality. So why did she throw me out? <laughs> <laughs> Baffles me too. You can see how angry it's made me. Aye, calm down. <laughs> Listen, it's probably just infatuation. Now he seems pretty serious. I was talking about Sandra. Simon. Don't stay here too long. This is just a bed and breakfast rented almost exclusively to the DSS. It's the end of the line. Menopausal mansions. Look at me, Simon. I wasn't always the wreck of a man you see before you. Now, don't be silly, Dougie. I guess that. Thanks. <laughs> Listen, this is not the place to solve your problems. You're surrounded by them. Look at those poor wretches, slave to the vino. And me and my gambling. But you've had therapy for that. You fought it and you won. I wouldn't have bet on it. <laughs> Listen, son. Would it help to talk about this? Dougie, there is something. I, it's difficult. Simon, there's no shame. A man's sexual inclinations are his own concern. I judge a man by his deeds, not his needs. Remember, you're better than no one and no one is better than you. I know you and Uncle Larry are trying to help. <laughs> but my problem is somewhat outside your field of experience. How do you mean, Simon? Well, you two being gay. Gay? <laughs> what the hell do you mean, gay? Uh, Dougie, there's no shame. You're better than no one and no one's better than you. Don't give me that old bollocks. <laughs> if you weren't wearing flip-flops, I'd punch a light out. Where do you get this gay nonsense from? Well, Mother said you were the reason Auntie Susan left Uncle Larry. Well, Mother was bloody well wrong. The only reason I'm here is that my house was repossessed. We thought you were gay. Me? <laughs> Whatever gave you that idea? <laughs> Coo, that'd make him chuckle down the model train club. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harry always said, Harry and your mum, like brother, like bloody sister. Jeez. Simon, do you love Sandra? Well, of course I do. Do you tell her you love her? Well, she must know we were engaged for seven years. <laughs> Simon, some years ago, I met a girl, one of many, I may add. She was very beautiful, and I fell for her. It was total love. Well, one day, she left me and kind of broke my heart. And I always think it's because I never told her I loved her. And that's what I'm saying. Tell Sandra how you feel. Don't keep secrets, Simon. Don't keep secrets. Is she the reason you became celibate? Celibate? <laughs> Who the hell told you that? Uncle Larry. The gobby mouth git! <laughs> Listen, Simon, this celibacy thing, keep it a secret, will you? I'm a teacher and children can be really cruel. <laughs> Look, Dougie, your secret's safe with me. And it's safe with me too, Dougie. <laughs> and the same goes for Boyo here as well. <laughs> It's a game, man. It's a game. You can't walk a hundred yards to quicksand without being accosted by beggars and down and outs. You can't see the pavement for outstretched palms. I've had them all. Homeless, starving, Kurdish refugees with Irish accents. It's no fun of being homeless, is it? Homeless? Most of them live in here. <laughs> Mr. Springer, I do not like to whinge, but wife and I are freezing our nuts off up in that room. <laughs> Put a heat in your room two weeks ago. Yes, but when do we get the paraffin? Exactly. Exactly. Have you seen the price of paraffin these days? No, but I've seen the council's regulation concerning heating. Oh! Oh! What is wrong? Shrapnel. I thought it was in your stomach. Well, it moves around like, you know. I could do that when I was younger. How are you feeling this morning? I never got a wink of sleep. Worrying about Sandra? No. 
chap in the next room kept singing Yellow Submarine all night long. <laughs> I'd like to move rooms. I'll feel silly telling my friends I'm living in the Eddie the Eagle suite. Well, tell Harry. Oh, I don't want him thinking I'm a pest. Well, I'll tell him. He doesn't bother me. I'm seriously considering following your example, Dougie. Oh, aye, what's that? Well, becoming celibate. <laughs> celibate? <laughs> oh, what do you mean? <laughs> I didn't say celibate. I said... <laughs> halibut. <laughs> you were thinking of becoming a halibut? No, I, I yeah, mean... I was a halibut once. It's not as good as it seems. <laughs> I was talking to Simon about fish, that's all. And they say the art of conversation is dying. <laughs> Listen to me, you big mouth bastard. The celibacy thing. It's not through sodden choice. I've never been good with women. It's a nervous thing. <laughs> Dougie, Dougie, Dougie. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't being offensive. Oh, you're a sodden good mimic. <laughs> Go, Mrs. Ern. Get your chewing tackle round that. Oh, my God. Is it Saturday again? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I seem to be upsetting everyone these days. No, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> Forget it. Simon, why don't you come out for a drink later with me and your uncle? Have a wee chat with him. He's a married man, or at least he was. Oh, no, he'd be exactly the same as mother. He'd only tell me off. Simon, your uncle is more understanding than you think. Yeah, yeah. Tell you what, man's beggars these days, they've got no pride in themselves. But you squat there with their arms outstretched. They don't even sing. <laughs> Back in the olden days, you got a group of sponges together, you had an opera. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with him now? Is he broken a nail or something, has he? <laughs> Dougie, you tell him. Aye. Sandra's having an affair with an 18-year-old bodybuilder. I meant tell him I wanted to move out the head of the eagle suite. <laughs> oh, Sandra's having an affair with a sprog and you've let her. Hey, sometimes I don't think we're related. You've got the killer instinct of a sponge. Listen, sad scamp, leave the boy alone. you will keep out of this, he's family. Oh, aye. He needs some sound advice, not slagging off. And who's going to give it to him? You, you've been turned down in massage parlours. <laughs> it's all my fault. Ah, <laughs> oh, don't be daft, man. He's never had much ink in his bick. I'm talking about Sandra. She always wanted a child. Well, looks like she's got one now, doesn't it? <laughs> Harry, I am not a violent man by nature, but one more word out of you, and I'm going to redecorate <clears throat> this hotel with your internal organs. Well, don't you want me shrapnel, me shrapnel. <laughs> it's not shrapnel. It's probably ulcers for any fry-ups or even appendicitis. They might have to cut it out. Oh, I forgot. You're petrified of hospitals, aren't you, you great English Jesse? God give me an appendix. I almost need one. No, you don't. Yes, you do. No, you don't. Yes, you do. Oh, for flip's sake, you do not need an appendix. It's a legacy from primeval times. Our bodies contain parts we never use. Tonsils, uh, appendix... Dougie's knob. <laughs> Listen, Balco, I've had more hens than you've had follicles. I'm not interested in what you jocks get up to what poultry. Will you just shut up? <laughs> I've always stood up for you. Even when Sandra accused you of making off with the top tier of our wedding cake. I even stuck up for you when Mother said you're a mean-spirited old bastard. But now, I'm beginning to wonder. God, I need a stiff one. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of them said that? <laughs> You've got the cultured sensitivity of a broken Guinness bottle. Can't you see the boy's worried sick? It's 9.15 in the morning and he's turning the alcohol. Have we got any advocate? <laughs> Southampton, three. Bolton Wanderers, three. Sheffield Wednesday, two. Everton, one. All right, Sandra Pitt, you leave that to me. I'll tell him. Simon, your troubles are over. I've just been on the blow to Sandra. You've done what? I've just reminded her of all the good times you two used to have together. Quiz nights at the Caravan Owners Club. <laughs> Barbecues at the Young Liberals Association. Your weekend walking breaks in Bronte country. See, I told you she'd be sorry. I said, hey, this Cohn and the Barbarian Junior might seem exciting now, but wait and see what he's like when his wisdom teeth come through. <laughs> anyway, she said she's going to come over here tonight, have a chat with you, sort things out. See, Uncle Harry's taking care of everything. Uh, Sandra's coming round here. I can't believe it. I mean, you, she, I better go and bathe and change. 
Well, change at least. <laughs> I'm glad it, despite what the rest of the family say about you. I think you're the tops. Silly sausage. <laughs> well, I take it all back. You're not as shallow, mean and insensitive as I thought you were. Thank you, Douglas. You see, men fall in love with their eyes and women with their ears. A woman needs to know that she's an intelligent human being, not just a brain-dead sex object. I'm almost impressed. So you should be. Switch over, man's time for beer watch. <laughs> What's a proxy night? When it comes to chatting up women, you're a bloody washout. I've got more chance going on the pull with the elephant, man. <laughs> Harry, you are perilously close to the edge of my patience. I've not forgotten what you said about my knob. <laughs> Simon, did Sandra not show up? Oh, don't tell me you blew it. I didn't blow anything. When Sandra said you were going to sort things out, she meant she was going to sort my things out. <laughs> Her and Colin brought it all round. The clothes, my Christa Burke collection, everything. She came here with him? Yes. It's a good job, really, because some of those cases are really heavy and he's a strong lad. <laughs> She's been coming for years. Do you remember she used to work in a supermarket? Well, one day, I happened to call in at Tesco's and I noticed a storeroom door was slightly ajar. Sandra and the manager were inside and he was kissing her neck. Well, you know me, I said something. <laughs> he tried to make out. She'd been stung stacking strawberries and he was trying to suck the poison out. <laughs> she did have a red mark on her neck, though. Maybe it was Tesco policy. Well, maybe. But Sandra worked for Asda. <laughs> oh, I've been deluding myself for years. Love. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? I'll have a word with him. She. All the years I've known them two. <laughs> Such a waste. Are you? But if. Hit now, who's like a persiatic come? So I can't watch you, Kusabunova. Exactly. <laughs> ah, no, not Sandra. I've done more than St. Duncan Good. You would have been wrong there like a fruit over here, stuck. <laughs> You can see that first part of Heartburn Hotel again on Friday night at 10 to 11 here on BBC One. And episode two will be next Monday at the same time, 10 o'clock. Next tonight, another new series, Angus Deaton's playing The Temptation Game.